This presentation called Managing the COPD Patient in the ICU is being brought to you by myself, Taryn Shenfield. I've been an education coordinator in respiratory therapy for over 30 years, and I have extensive experience with patients who are in the ICU, especially those who are COPDers. As we all know, the COPD patient represents one of the most difficult weans in the ICU. So I'm going to share with you some strategies I've learned over the years, and hopefully you could take them to the bedside. As we all are aware, smoking is the number one cause for COPD. The best thing to do is never smoke at all. Almost 85% of all COPD patients in this country come from cigarette smoke. Cigarette smoke does irreversible damage to the lung. You cannot really redo it. And why people smoke, I have no clue. And there has to be some kind of system in place to actually prevent people from smoking. Even if you raise the prices of cigarettes, people still smoke. Even if you stop smoking in public places, people still smoke. So I don't understand the drive to smoke, but if they smoke and they end up getting COPD, then they're under our care. The objectives to today's lecture are, I'm going to talk about some statistics. I'm going to talk about how you diagnose COPD. I'm going to talk about how spirometry is used to determine the level of severity. I'm going to talk about some treatment options. And then once you have COPD and you come to the ICU, uh, we typically start using non-invasive ventilation which could progress to intubation, and then eventually we have to wean them from the ventilator. So I'm gonna cover all these topics today and hope that you really take some of this back to the bedside. Let's talk about some statistics about COPD. In this country, there's approximately 16 million people who have been diagnosed with COPD, but you can imagine there are millions and millions of other people who have not been diagnosed. The gold standard for diagnosing COPD is to actually do spirometry testing, which we'll talk about a little bit later. In the past, cigarette smoking was mostly done by men, but recently, in recent years, over the last 12 years, it seems like women smoke more than men. And the biggest group of COPDers are women in the age bracket of 65 to 74. Um, typical in five years, the mortality rates could be anywhere from 40 to 70 percent, but that depends on what stage you are, and which I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, COPD encompasses many different things. Sometimes you can get chronic bronchitis. Chronic bronchitis is mostly uh, caused by cigarette smoking, and actually it's um, having constant coughing. Um, another severe case is emphysema, which is part of COPD, and 85% of all cases of COPD are a result of smoking. But there is another group of 15% that are caused by other causes. And this other group represents occupational hazards. For example, people who work in factories with poor ventilation with uh, dust particles in the air or some kind of corrosive parts in the air can breathe this in. They get occupational uh, COPD. My mother actually worked in a dry cleaning factory where actually when you walked into there, you could just smell the chemicals. And the sad part was that she also smoked cigarettes. So my mother ended up getting COPD with a double whammy. She had emphysema. She was eventually intubated. And sorry to say, she passed while she was on a ventilator. So COPD statistics speak to the fact that the number one cause is smoking. And the second could be occupational hazards that you could get from various type of work you do. So how do you diagnose COPD? One of the best ways to do it is get a history of the patient. If the patient has a strong smoking history and they smoked cigarettes for many years, and or if they worked in a factory that had um, toxic fumes in the factory, these are two well-known factors that could lead into COPD. Another way of you could doing it, which is like the gold standard, is to do spirometry testing. When you think about spirometry testing, it's your forced expiratory volume in one second or the forced expiratory volume 
one second over force vital capacity, or you could do a diffusing capacity test. All of these tests can help diagnose COPD. If you do a force vital capacity and you have a normal FEV1, and an FEV1 is a forced expiratory volume in one second, so you blow out as hard as you can for one second, and that is your FEV1. And your FVC, which is forced vital capacity, is you take a deep breath in and you blow all the way out. So it determines your total lung volume. So the ratio of FVV1 over FVC is very important. If your FVC is decreased, but your ratio of FVV1 to FVC is normal, this indicates you have a restrictive pattern. A normal ratio is anywhere from 70 to 80 percent in adults and around 85 percent in children. When you think about restrictive lung disease, those are where your tissue is damaged and you can't really breathe in normal. And some examples of restrictive lung disease is pulmonary fibrosis. Um, also, you can have deformities of the chest such as scoliosis or you could even get some lung surgery where you had cancer, you get a lobectomy or pneumectomy. So all of those causes can cause restrictive lung disease. If you have a decreased FEV1 over FVC ratio and it's decreased, this is consistent with an obstructive pattern. Usually this diagnosis is reached when the FEV1 over FVC is less than 70% and it's less than 85% in children. And typically this means there's some kind of consolidation or constriction in the lung, and most of those cases are for asthma, COPD, emphysema, bronchiolectasis, and bronchiolitis. So those kind of things will all give you a decreased FEV1 ratio, and that's consistent with obstructive pattern. When you think about the diffusion capacity test, this is used to measure the alveolar capillary membrane. So what they do is they diffuse some carbon dioxide from, I'm sorry, some carbon monoxide. They diffuse it into the lung and they look how it goes over the alveolar capillary membrane. And this can determine what kind of damage you have, mostly interstitial lung disease, but also patients with emphysema have a problem with this too. So these are some of the tests you can do with spirometry. In regard to an x-ray, you know, the typical signs of an x-ray that someone has COPD is they have flattened diaphragms because they have too much aeration in the lungs. Also, they get this barrel chest type of look to them. That's another indicator. And finally, another diagnostic tool you could use is the blood gas. The blood gas, um, typically, if you're a COPD or for a long period of time, you end up having respiratory acidosis, but it's basically compensated so that your bicarb levels are high. So your pH is fairly normal, but your PCO2 could be high, and but then your bicarb is high, so you're compensated. So these are some of the standard diagnostic tests they use to identify patients with COPD. When measuring the severity of COPD, we use what is known as the GOLD spirometry guidelines. And the GOLD stands for Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease. And based upon your spirometry testing, they will put you into a category of either mild, moderate, severe, or very severe. And when you think about this, each particular category, as in mild and severe or mild, whatever you are, you will be on a different treatment option. So for example, if you're in the mild category, you might just be on a simple um, bronchodilator where you get into moderate, you might be on a bronchodilator with some inhaled corticosteroids and where you get into severe, you might be on theophylline, you know, long-term acting beta agonist. You could also be on, you know, oral steroids and so on. So how do they actually come up with each category? And they do that through spirometry. So if you're in a mild category, um, your FEV1 
which is the amount of air you could blow out in one second, is less is greater than 80% as predicted, but your force expiratory volume in one second over FVC is less than 70%. That seems to be the common denominator. In other words, your FEV1 over FVC has to be less than 70%, which is really not normal. So the other category is your FEV1. So your FEV1, if it's less than 80%, you are considered moderate. If it's less than 50%, you are considered severe. And if it's less than 30%, you are very severe. And based upon your score, that is where your treatment plan would follow. So now that you've been diagnosed with COPD and you know what level you are, your physician will come up with a treatment plan for you. And as I was saying at the beginning of this lecture, 85% um, of the COPD cases come from smoking. So one of the best things you could do is stop smoking. And they might prescribe some medication to help you with this. They might help you with some other plans on smoking cessation programs. Another very important thing is diet and exercise. It seems like there's a lot of muscle wasting with COPD. And as you probably all know, if you eat too much carbohydrates, uh, you will produce too much CO2, which will increase your work of breathing, which could make you really beat up. Um, bronchodilators, corticosteroids, antibiotics, anxiolytics, all of these are treatment options for COPDs. Many COPDs, because they feel short of breath and they get nervous, they get anxiety. And that's why they give anxiolytics. A lot of times they have repeated bouts of uh, pulmonary infections, and that's the use for antibiotics. And the mainstay for the management of COPD is corticosteroids with bronchodilators. And so you base your treatment plan based upon your severity that was established through the gold standards. COPD exasperation. Many COPDs, especially the ones in late stages of COPD, like stage three and four in the gold standard, um, end up having what is known as a COPD exasperation. A COPD exasperation mostly ends up with someone being admitted to the emergency room and then potentially be sent up to the ICU or the floor. Um, there are many causes for COPD exasperation. It could be that they have some kind of bacterial infection. They end up getting a pneumonia. They could have a cold or a flu, which is, which is viral in nature, and that could cause an exasperation. It could be that they come in contact with someone who has a perfume or you know, pro prolonged exposure to some kind of smoke. So... You know, they get COPD exasperations and typically they got up, they have to actually increase the dosage of their mandatory medications they take for management. Um, a lot of times they don't recognize this and they go really right into um, severe COPD exasperation. And how do you recognize this? How do you realize when you can't treat yourself at home and you need to go to the emergency room? And... The things you need to look for is, number one, if the patient is confused and doesn't realize what's going on or can't name some facts that they should know, that is a sign that they need to go right to the emergency room. Another sign is a severe headache. If you get a severe headache and you have COPD and it's been lasting for hours, this is another problem. If you can't say some words, if someone's talking to you and they can't get a full sentence out, that's another sign. If they can't walk to the bathroom or they get, you know, they get very tired and they don't want to go to their bedroom, they'd rather go sleep on the couch in the living room, all of these are signs. So when you go into COPD exasperation, this is a time when you go back into the emergency room and this is where the treatment starts and this is what we do best. So now your patient is brought to the emergency room and as we all know, what is one of the first things you do? You're going to get a blood gas. And then most likely you're going to put someone on some non-invasive ventilation like the V60. Um, you might also consider high-flow nasal cannula. 
Let me go into a little bit more detail. So you get a blood gas on a patient and they turn out to be acidotic because they can't compensate and their PCO2 is climbing maybe over 70. Um, at this point, you're going to try non-invasive ventilation. So what is your initial settings with non-invasive ventilation? Basically, they start at 10 over 5 and there have been some studies that the V60 has a special mode on it called AVAPS, A-V-A-P-S. And basically that's average volume assured pressure support where you would dial in a predicted tidal volume for them. And then you would have a titrating IPAP setting going with it. So in other words, um, they've been shown that using AVAPS with the V60 has been shown to be beneficial because it sort of stabilizes the minute ventilation because sometimes minute ventilation changes with compliance changes and resistance changes. So, you know, try some non-invasive ventilation. If you're going to do some initial settings, 10 over 5, if you want to get really good where the evidence is going, you try AVAPs. And AVAPs, um, you have to titrate the settings based upon the ideal body weight. And this particular lecture is not about AVAPs, but keep that in mind. Um, so what's the role of high-flow nasal cannula? Um, studies have shown that patients with stage 2 and 3 uh, COPD can benefit from high-flow nasal cannula. And they have shown some studies where if you give a flow about 30 liters per minute, it actually decreased the work of breathing on these, on these patients and actually could prevent intubation. So high-flow nasal cannula has its, has its use, but not really in severe cases of COPD because it won't really blow off all the CO2 you need. I mean, I know all the benefits of high-flow nasal cannula, uh, but when you have someone with a PCO2 that's over 70 and you have, they're in acidotic, you know, you might most likely going to have to use non-invasive ventilation. So you put someone on non-invasive ventilation, how long do you keep them there? Studies have shown that if they don't respond favorably within one hour after putting them on, you really need to intubate them. Like I'm just saying like their blood gas is critical at this point and they're not responding to non-invasive ventilation. You really need to intubate. So our patient failed non-invasive ventilation and we decide to intubate. Let's move on. I want to go over a few more things with you. The scenario I just told you about was a patient who comes into the emergency room with an exasperation of COPD. And we try non-invasive ventilation. We may even try high-flow nasal cannula. But there are certain indications that sort of you don't try non-invasive ventilation. You don't try um, high-flow nasal cannula. You go right to intubations. And those cases are number one you have an acute exasperation of COPD. So if your PCO2 is like 75 and your pH is like 7.15, don't even think about it. You just intubate. Someone goes into respiratory failure and they can't breathe, you intubate. Someone has a pneumothorax, you intubate. Someone has bleeding in the lungs, you intubate. So these things warrant immediate intubation rather than trying the non-invasive mode first. Let's go a little bit more into detail about how you actually manage a patient with non-invasive ventilation. And basically, they're in respiratory failure, and that's your reason for doing it. Here are some evidence-based guidelines on the management of a COPD exasperation. The goal is to keep the SATs above 90. You don't need 95. All you need is SATs above 90. You want your PaO2 to be greater than 60. You might want to use some bronchodilators and some anticholinergic agents. You could definitely get them on some steroids. Um, most times, a COPD exasperation could be either viral in nature or it could actually be bacterial in nature. So you have to actually determine which one it is. And if it is bacterial, you may want to start some antibiotics. Mucomis, mucolytic agents. All evidence has shown that 
currently there's no good evidence to support the use of any kind of mucolytic agent such as mucamus. Chest physical therapy for exasperation, completely ineffective. More evidence is coming out with that. They, the American Association of Respiratory Care has done some guidelines on that, and they do not recommend chest physiotherapy for COPD exasperations. How about Heliox? Again, insufficient data. Heliox works good for asthmatic patients, but it's not been shown to be very good for COPD patients. And high-flow nasal cannula has shown some use, but not for patients who are in hypercapnic respiratory failure. So if your PCO2 is greater than 70, really don't go to high-flow nasal cannula. Go to maybe non-invasive ventilation, like I said, for an hour. A little bit more on non-invasive ventilation. NIV is actually the gold standard for hypercapnic respiratory failure due to COPD. But many patients who are on NIV fail. Actually, the failure rates for NIV is anywhere from 20 to 30%. And you may be asking, why do they have such high failure rate? And the reason is um, you have to give them time and when I say time, you only can give them up to an hour to see if there's any kind of improvement on the blood gases. Um, if you don't intubate somebody, with an, if they don't do better after one hour on NIV, their mortality goes through the roof. Also, this increases your ICU stay. Another important factor is your Apache score. An Apache score is a index based upon you how sick you are so it's all based on age it's based on comorbidities it's based on your vital signs it's based on certain chemistry in your blood so basically if you know your apache score people with a high apache score are most likely going to fail and so you really need to understand a little bit more about apache scores I don't have time to go into the full details of Apache scores, but this is a very good tool. Also, adequate staffing. When someone's on non-invasive ventilation, you really need to manage them properly. A lot of times, we don't get enough staff in the emergency room to really manage these COPD patients, and I'm sure we could all relate to that. So these are the indications for non-invasive ventilation. Of course, the patient has to be conscious. They have to be able to respond to questions. They have to have a respiratory rate greater than 30. Their pH has to be greater than 7.2. The PaO2 could be uh, less than 60, and you have to look at the PF ratio. If they have a PF ratio of 150, I would intubate them. I would intubate anyone with a PF ratio less than 200. If their heart rate's greater than 120, um, all of these are indicators of using non-invasive ventilation. Also, these on the flip side to that, you know when to intubate. Some of the contraindications to non-invasive ventilation, it could be any kind of trauma to the face. It could be facial abnormalities. It could be they're at high risk of aspiration. Uh, they could be hemodynamically unstable. Uh, they might not be responsive. You know, you tell them to you know, put their thumb up and they're really not doing anything. So these are all contraindications to non-invasive ventilation. You should recognize when you could put someone on NIV versus when you need to intubate. So let's talk about how to manage a patient with BiPAP. A lot of hospitals now have the V60 BiPAP, which I think is really, you know, the Cadillac of BiPAPs. And some of the modes we really know is ST mode. We've been using ST mode forever, which is spontaneous timed. Um, but the V60 has two other modes that you probably don't know too much about unless you do. Uh, one of them is called PCV mode, which is pressure control ventilation, and the other one is AVAPS, which I'm a big fan of AVAPS. So let's, I'm not going to go over ST mode because I think you know this. Let's talk about pressure control mode. Pressure control mode actually lets you set a fixed eye time. And 
the benefit of a fixed I time is that you allow more time for gas distribution and actually the removal of CO2. So when you have a patient who has a high CO2, the PCV mode may work very well because it gives you a fixed I time. A better choice is actually to use AVAPs. AVAPs, Average Volume Assured Pressure Support. Basically, you dial in a predicted tidal volume and the ventilator or the BiPAP V60 will actually deliver that tidal volume. They'll try to target that tidal volume. And because the IPAP setting at this point is not fixed, with AVAPs, you do not have a fixed IPAP setting. You have a floating IPAP setting. So instead of using an IPAP of 12, you could the IPAP setting could go anywhere from 12 to 18. So based on positional changes of the patient or resistance, resistance type of things with the airway, you can actually have a titrating IPAP setting. As a result, it stabilizes your miniventilation and stabilizes your PCO2. Um, what's the advantage of a dual limb circuit versus a single limb circuit? Most BiPAPs are single limb circuits. Most ventilators that you do non-invasive ventilation is a dual limb circuit. The advantages of a dual limb circuit is number one, you can measure exhale tidal volumes. So you can see what comes back out of the ventilator with the dual limb circuit better than you can with a single limb circuit. Um, the disadvantages of a dual limb circuit is that the inspiratory flow is not that high. Typically, a dual limb circuit will give you a maximum inspiratory flow of 160, where a single limb circuit will give you a maximum inspiratory flow of 240. So you say, what's the difference? In the presence of a big leak, it's better to have high flow because it compensates for the leak. And that is the advantage of a single limb circuit versus a dual limb circuit. The advantage of the dual limb circuit is you can monitor the exhale tidal volumes more accurately than you can with the single limb circuit. So personally, I think the BiPAP V60 is, a, and I don't work for the company, but I think it's a great BiPAP. And I think that's your best choice for the, PCO, the COPD patient. I just wanted to share with you the use of AVAPs with COPD patients. And they found that with AVAPs, they actually compared ST mode with AVAPs. And they found that the patients with AVAPs actually had a, they did much better with COPD management than the ST mode. So there's a lot of evidence out there showing how BiPAP, AVAPS mode works better than the ST mode. So I really think you should understand a little bit more about it. And I know many of you know this already. So it's just a little food for thought. So we tried the V60. We tried them on ST mode. We tried them on AVAPS. We even did PCV. And they're not doing well. So we gave them one hour. Remember, you only want to give them one hour. The one hour, they did not improve. So you decide to intubate. So what are some of the indications of intubating a patient? You have increased muscle use, accessory muscle use. You have increased PCO2 values. They don't meet the criteria for NIV like facial deformities or hemodynamic instability. They have a reduced level of consciousness. Their respiratory rate is greater than 35. Their pH is less than 7.2. Their PF ratio is less than 150. I would even go so far as the PF ratio less than 200. Their heart rate's greater than 140. And they are hemodynamically unstable. And they need vasopressors. So these are indications where you better intubate them. And now we're going to talk about managing them on the ventilator. So... We intubate the patient. Some initial settings. We could use either assist control or SIMV. We could also use pressure control ventilation. You basically want to keep your tidal volumes anywhere from 5 to 8 cc's per kilogram. Um, you want to have um, a lower rate to, low, to avoid intrinsic PEEP. You get much better... Um, aeration of the alveola 
when you use the proper tidal volume than you do by increasing the rate because sometimes increasing the rate actually ventilates dead space, which actually does nothing for the CO2. Your PEEP setting. Basically, you should establish what your intrinsic PEEP is. Now, how do you know what intrinsic PEEP is? Intrinsic PEEP is trapped air in your lungs, which typically the COPDs have. And a lot of the new end ventilators have, um, you can measure your intrinsic PEEP. I would suggest that once you measure your intrinsic PEEP, add two to that, and that will be your PEEP settings. You want to keep your eye ratio from one to two. No, actually from one to three or one to four, because you want to allow more time for exhalation. Um, if you have a servo, you want to use PRVC. If you have a Draga ventilator, you want to use Autoflow. If you have a Puritan Bennett ventilator, you, you want to use VC+. Why do you want to use this? Because actually, this will automatically determine the inspiratory flow based upon the compliance and resistance of the patients. These particular settings work very well because they actually work with the patients. So based upon their compliance and resistance, they'll get the proper inspiratory flow, which means that they're not going to actually buck the vent and actually delivers a pressure which is lower and protects the airway. Keep your peak pressures less than 40 to 45 and keep your plateau pressures less than 30. So these are some initial settings you want to do. And I'm sure you all know how to manage the ventilator. I think the real take home points here is knowing how to set your PEEP based upon intrinsic PEEP. That you got to keep that in mind. Using a low tidal volume strategy because you don't want to overinflate the lung and create some kind of barrel trauma to the lung and keep your peak pressures lower. And one of the ways of keeping your peak airway pressures lower is using PRVC, Autoflow, or VC+, and also keep your plateau pressures less than 30. Let's talk about the management of the COPD patient on a ventilator. And more importantly, let's talk about predictors of extubation failure. We all know that the COPD patient is one of the most difficult patients to wean from the ventilator. And there are tools that you could use to determine whether the patient would be a good extubation. They did a study in um, the Journal of Critical Care Medicine in 2006, and they looked at predictors of extubation failure in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And I'm gonna highlight some of the, th the findings of this study. So what they found was that physicians typically use a tool called, remember I was telling you about the Apache score before? Another example of the Apache score, which is the, almost the same thing, is called the Simplified Acute Physiologic Score. It's called the SAPS-2 score. Basically, when the patient's admitted in the hospital for the first time, they look to see what the type diagnosis is. They look to see if they have any chronic diseases. They look at their Glasgow Coma Scale. They look at their age. They look at their blood pressure. They look at their heart rate. They look at if they were using any kind of mechanical ventilation or CPAP at home. They look at urine output and some blood chemistry. The point which I'm making is this, based upon the scoring system of it, all these things I just mentioned, they come up with a score. So just because I'm admitted because I have an exasperation of COPD, everyone is different. So if you and I are both admitted to the hospital for COPD exasperation, I'm older, you're younger. I have more comorbidities than you do. My Glasgow coma scale is lower than yours. So my blood pressure is high. I have a problem with, um, I have cardio cardiovascular disease. So even though we're both admitted for COPD exasperation, because my acuity and my illness is higher, I have a higher SAPS-2 score. So based upon your SAPS-2 score, and this is initially done when you first come in, you, this could be an indicator of a more difficult wean. So the higher the SAPS-2 score, the higher likelihood you're going to fail in extubation. And that's when you need to do some other stuff, which I'll explain. So let's talk about the SAPS-2 score. 
What the SAPS-2 score does, it predicts mortality. It also predicts how difficult the wean you may be. So as you notice on the bottom, you have the total points over here, right? That represents your SAP score based upon all those physiologic parameters before. And on this side, you have all your predicted mortality. So as you can see, as the score is 20, your predicted mortality is like 5%. But if your score is 40, your predicted mortality is 30%. And it goes on and on and on. So the point which I'm trying to say is when you get the SAPS2 score on the patient and they are high, they're greater than 20, that's when you would consider that this could be a difficult, difficult extubation. And then I'm going to show you some tools to use to make them wean off the ventilator quicker. So now we know what the SAP score is, SAPS2 score. Let's talk about some other studies. They did a study where they were predicting failure in COPD patients. So you have a COPD or on a ventilator, you try to extubate them and they fail. And what they did, they did a retrospective study and they looked between the years of 1996 and 2002. So they had 148 patients with COPD. Of those 148 patients, 65% of them came off the ventilator very well. 17% of them after being extubated went over to NIV and then 18% of them required reintubation. So 18% is pretty high. That means almost like one in five had to be reintubated. And you know that the mortality increases every time you reintubate somebody. So I'm going to teach you how to predict that they're going to be a difficult wean, and then I'm going to teach you some new tricks you should know. I wanted to drill down a little bit more into the demographics of the patients in this study. First of all, what I really want you to pay attention to is a lot of them were on home mechanical ventilation. And these are a big indicator of you need to watch. So anyone on home mechanical ventilation is a problem. Another thing you really got to look at is your SAPS2 score. We just explained what the SAPS2 score was. So patients who had a SAPS2 Two score of over 38 were a difficult wean. So these two factors I want you to pay attention to so that if they were using non-invasive ventilation at home and they had a SAPS2 score of greater than 38 upon admission, then you have to treat these patients a little bit differently. So let's talk more about the patient characteristics. Um, you want to know what kind of COPD patients on a ventilator had a successful extubation versus how many had a failed extubation. So what you have here is on the top right over here, you have extubation success, extubation failure. And one of the common things that really stand out, remember I was telling you about the SAPS2 score? If you look at the SAPS2 score, the success rate was for those who had a SAPS2 score less than 37. And the people who had a SAPS2 score greater than 42 mostly failed. Another thing you want to look at is the use of home mechanical ventilation or non-invasive ventilation. And they found that the success rate was only three for non-invasive use of ventilators at home and versus 10 for failure. So the things that jump out at you with this is if you have a SAP score greater than 42, if you are using non-invasive ventilation at home, there's a greater chance you're going to have a failed extubation. And this is the point what I'm going to make and how we can resolve that. Another thing they were looking at these patients was endotracheal aspirates. And what they did is they cultured the patient right here. They cultured the patient. And they found the patients who failed were actually shown to be positive for pathogens. So what that means, you did a endo, endo, endotracheal aspiration, you know, you suction the patient, you sent it to the lab, and if they still had growth, they had a greater likelihood of failure. So understanding cultures is another important part of understanding how someone could pass or fail an extubation attempt. So this slide speaks to the total 
concept of this. Things you got to look out for. So if you have someone who's admitted to your hospital in your ICU and they're intubated and they're a COPD and then you're trying to wean them, here are some things you could use and mark to know they may be a difficult wean. Um, number one, if they use non-invasive home ventilation. If they do, they're at greater risk. Another thing, if you have a SAP score greater than 35 on admission, that's another indicator of failure. And then what you really want is to have a sterile endotracheal aspirates at the day of extubation. So if they use non-invasive ventilation at home, they got a SAPS 2 score greater than 35, and they have a sterile endotracheal aspirates, that's a good sign. But if you have growth, that's a bad sign. So if you have any of these, I'm going to give you another tool to determine how to wean them from the ventilator. I wanted to do a little summary with you. Number one, COPD patients have an extubation failure rate around 35%. The mortality of those patients is roughly between 9 and 15%. So you really want to understand a little bit more about their underlying medical condition. You want to really look at the severity of illness based on admission data. And what you want to look at is your SAPS-2 score or your Apache score. And here are some predisposing risk factors. Number one, if you use non-invasive ventilation at home, you're a greater chance of failure. If you have a SAPS-2 score greater than 35 on admission, you have a greater likelihood of failure. If you have a positive culture on, of, when, on your endotracheal aspirate within 72 hours of extubation, you going to have a failure. So basically, you want no growth. And then I'm going to tell you, if you have any of these, what to do about it. Here are some other tricks you can look for. If you have to suction a patient every one to two hours, there's a greater chance they're going to fail extubation. There's an eightfold increase in extubation failure. Uh, you got to be ready to use non-invasive ventilation if someone fails an extubation attempt. So you could extubate someone to NIV, which is a common practice. If you want to determine how strong their cough is, you could do what is known as the white card test, the WCT. Basically, you try to have the patient cough through the endotracheal tube. And if they could get secretions in the endotracheal tube, that means they got a forcible cough as a greater likelihood they're going to pass. And just be aware of your SAPS-2 score. If you have a SAPS-2 score greater than 35 upon admission, they're going to be a difficult wean. And we're going to tell a little bit more about what you could do about it later. I just explained some patients who are COPDs who are difficult weans and the predisposing factors. So you know the SAPS-2 score, you know they use non-invasive ventilation at home, and you know that they have some kind of growth in the airway. So if you have someone who's failed extubation attempts and you're really kind of cautious how to go about it, I have a great tool for you. And this tool is called the Early Phase of Miniventilation Recovery Curve that predicts extubation failure better than the minute ventilation recovery time. That's a mouthful. But basically what I'm saying to you, you have a difficult patient to wean, and I'm going to teach you tricks on how to wean them and how to do a test without extubating them, then re-intubating them. So let me tell you a little bit more details about the Hernandez study. What they did, they figured a way of measuring your respiratory capacity for work after you're extubated. So what that means is, you know, if you have a weak respiratory system in regard to your lungs and your muscles and your capacity to breathe and cough, you're going to fail. So they found a way to actually measure this without pulling out the ET tube. And think of this as almost, if you wanted to determine the fitness level of a person, what you could do is take their baseline heart rate, which say is 80. Then you could tell them to run 20 yards and come back, run 20 yards and come back, run 20 yards. They do 10 times 20 yards and back. Then you measure their heart rate, and now their heart rate's 130. So their baseline heart rate is 80, 
And after they run 20 yards 10 times, they end up having a heart rate of 130. How long, how many minutes it takes their heart rate to get back to baseline to go from 130 to 1 to 80 determines your fitness. So if you're really fit, your heart rate will go back to 80 within seven minutes, six minutes. But if you're not fit, your heart's going to beat very fast for a long period of time. And they actually did the same kind of philosophy and test with your minute ventilation. So what they did is while a patient's on pressure support, they actually measured their minute ventilation. So they're on a pressure support of 10 and they measure their minute ventilation. Say their minute ventilation is seven liters per minute or eight liters per minute. Then what they did is they took the pressure support off and made it zero. And they did this for about 20 minutes. And what happened was after having no pressure support, of course their respiratory rate went up and so did their minute ventilation. Then they, what they did was they titrated back the, the pressure support to 10. And then they counted how long it took their respiratory rate or minute ventilation to get back to baseline. So how this test works is number one, you get your minute ventilation while you have pressure support on. Number two, you turn the pressure support back to zero and then you measure the change in minute ventilation and you do this for 20 minutes. Then what you do is put back the pressure support to 10 and you measure how long it takes them to get back to baseline. And what they found was that this test made you, it determined your respiratory strength and capacity and how quickly you recovered back to baseline meant how good an extubation you would be. And I'll tell you more on the next slide how this works. So you have your difficult patient who you're trying to wean from the ventilator and there is COPD. You can apply this to other patients too, but let's talk about the COPD. So what you do, it's broken down into three stages. One here is your pre-SBT. This is when you have your pressure support of 10 or whatever. Then you shut down the pressure support and you do this for 20 minutes right here. And then finally, you put back the pressure support and that re represents your recovery time, which is right here. And what you could see, the people with this dark, this area right here, this area right here, they were successful, successful, and these were the failures and failures. And let me show you how this works. So basically, when they started, when they were pre-SBT, the people who failed typically had a little bit higher minute ventilation than the people who passed. So what you do, you turn the pressure support off right here, and when you turn the pressure support off, your minute ventilation increases. See how it increases going up like this? And almost the people who passed or failed were right up around here. So see this area right here? So the minute ventilation went all the way up to almost 13 liters. It started around 10 or 11, and it went all the way up to almost 13 or 14. And then what you did, you put the pressure support back on in this field right here. And you notice the people with the dark line recovered very quickly. In other words, their minute ventilation went down the baseline right here actually within six minutes. So the key is, and then the group that failed, their minute ventilation right here never really went down the baseline. It just like sort of stayed elevated and they failed. So the question, the test is, you do this test, you put them on the pre-SBT and you keep the pressure support on, then you shut the pressure support off, you let them run for about 20 minutes, then you put the pressure support back on. If they recover within six minutes, they will be a successful extubation. And this test has been shown to be very valid. So these were the final results of that Hernandez study, which showed very success rate of minute ventilation recovery. And, you know, I think the other two slides speaks to it all. Some final remarks for weaning the COPD patients. Number one, observe secretion clearance. If you have to suction every one to two hours, they're going to probably fail. If you wanted to determine the strength of their cough, you should do the white card test, which basically means that 
you tell the patient to cough, you disconnect the ventilator, keep them intubated, and tell them to cough. If you see secretions coming into the ET tube, they're good. Um, look at your SAPS 2 score and Apache scores in your decision making, because you know if you have a SAPS score of greater than 35, you know, there's a good chance that they are going to you know, be a, a difficult extubation. Incorporate your Glasgow Coma Scale and RAS scores. Well, I didn't get into much on the RAS scores, but that's a sedation scale. Determine if the patient has upper airway edema. Basically, you deflate the cuff, make sure air gets around. Sometimes patients who have are predisposed to extubation failure will have a PCO2 greater than 444 at the time of extubation. So be, when you get a blood gas before you're extubating, if the PCO2 is greater than 44, greater chance of failure. If you're really unsure about a patient, if they're going to do well, utilize the Hernandez Minute Ventilation Recoveries tool and be, be careful of pressure support weaning methods because actually pressure support weaning methods can really give inaccurate results. You really need to sort of have them work on their own. I want to thank you all for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and I'm here now to take any kind of questions on this.